Okay, here we are in lecture 12, uh, really about jury selection process. Uh, and, and we left off at the, at the point of creating a jury uh, pool, and now we're going to select from that pool to actually create the, the jury. Uh, this is the process of voir dire to see and to speak, as we've already discussed. So, goals of voir dire then, theoretically, to select a fair and representative jury. Uh, but actually, this is not necessarily what's going on. Let's face it, we, live, we are in an adversarial system. That is our court system. So we expect everyone to come and fight the good fight. So what do you think attorneys actually want to do? Fair and representative? Attorneys want to win. They want to win for their clients. So, so they want to identify and eliminate unfavorable jurors. That is, when we see and speak to these jurors, if I have any idea that this person might be not on my side, I want to prevent them from ending up on the jury during the voir dire process. Now, notice also that this is a unique time in the court process because now we have everyone together. We have the prosecutors, we have the defense attorneys, we have the defendant, right? We have the judge, and we have who's going to be on the jury. So this is a great time, you know, some people might argue that the trial in certain aspects has already begun before the trial begins. So uh, at this point in time, if I'm a good attorney, I might want to attempt to indoctrinate and influence potential jurors. I want to create a positive impression of myself and my client. If I'm on the defense side or on the prosecution side, I want to make the case look good. So how do we challenge people? How do we get them to not be selected for the jury pool? Well, people can be dismissed during the process of voir dire in two ways. They can be challenged for cause, and, and this one is pretty straight up. There's a specific reason why the jurors should not serve, and this usually ties to the fact that I can argue as an attorney that they're inflexibly biased, they're prejudiced, or have special relationship to parties in the case. Right? So if I'm the nephew of the judge, uh, that is probably going to have me eliminated from the case. If I show up with a swastika tattooed on the side of my neck and the defendant is Jewish, I could probably make a good case that this person then shouldn't serve on the jury because of their blatant anti-Semitism as displayed by uh, sporting a swastika. So this is for cause. The, the strange thing is this is unlimited you have unlimited cause challenges as an attorney, but they're very rare in practice. Uh, people don't necessarily display their biases to such an extent, uh, probably more along the lines of relationships, but e even then, uh, not so much. Now, preemptory challenges then constitute where we see most of the challenges to jurors being dismissed and not being allowed onto the pool. This allows me a preemptory challenge, by definition allows me to say, hey, uh, yeah, number 13, I don't want them, eliminate them, get them the heck out of here, right? Uh, and I don't have to supply a reason. So the number varies of these peremptory challenges by the jurisdiction and by the judge setting the guidelines for the trial at the beginning. Okay? So uh, depending on the jurisdiction, depending on the judge's decisions. So uh, let's, let's look at a, a little cartoon here. Yeah, uh, these, these uh, jurors might be inflexibly biased towards the defendant in this case. Now let's talk seriously about preemptory challenges. Uh, what do we know? The number varies with jurisdiction, seriousness of the crime, the type of cause. Uh, just some examples. Criminal defense gets the same or more than prosecution in criminal trials. In civil cases, both sides get the same amount, and this is typically going to be less than it would be in criminal trials. Felonies, uh, Fed gives prosecution six, the defense gets 10, so it's usually biased in favor uh, of the defense, but that can vary. Defense can petition for more in special circumstances, maybe pretrial publicity or other issues. Now, what about rulings, that is court rulings on the use of peremptory challenges, and why would there need to be court rulings? Well. Let's suppose that, and I'm going to pick on the South a little bit, and that's where a lot of these rules have occurred from, because it was difficult maybe for the trial process to be fair in the South historically. Uh, let's suppose that we have a black defendant who's guilty of a crime against a white person. Uh, and they, well, I mean, alleged to be guilty of a crime towards a white person. 
what uh, the prosecutor might do then is systematically or used all their preemptory challenges towards potential black jury members who might represent uh, a, a hung jury uh, in, in this case. So in an effort to kind of level the playing field for all citizens within a, a community, we see this series of decisions. And let's start with Batson versus Kentucky. Blacks cannot be systematically excluded from the jury of a black defendant, right? So what they're saying is you just can't say, hey, I'm going to use all my peremptory challenges on all the black people in the jury pool, right, uh, so that I can get myself an all-white jury. Uh, it, it violates the defendant's right to equal protection under the 14th Amendment. That is, you're protected. You have the right to serve on a jury regardless of your color. You shouldn't be excluded on the basis of your color from serving on a jury. Uh, but, you know, how does this work? And you know the law will be modified as time goes on. So Holland versus Illinois, no racial group can be systematically excluded from the jury of any defendant. So now it's not just blacks, but any racial group, right? In 1991, two decisions, Supreme Court held that striking jurors based on the race is unconstitutional. It violates equal protection of the rights of jurors, right, as, as well as the defendants. So how does this work now? What do we see actually happen in the court process? Well, if a black juror is excused, the lawyer's got to provide a race-neutral explanation. So if I'm going to exclude a black juror, then I have to explain why I've excluded that person. And notice it's going to be towards certain groups, not everyone. But the problem with this is like, well, it's a guideline, but it has no teeth. Because basically the judge must accept the explanation as genuine. So whatever I say as an attorney, the judge is kind of bound to uh, have to accept that explanation. The Supreme Court stuck down a lower appeals court instruction that requires a plausible explanation. So as it went through the appellate process, it says, yeah, the judge has got to accept it, but it's got to at least be plausible. And the court said, no, it doesn't even have to be plausible. It appears that the judges will accept just about any explanation counsel provides. Uh, so this law has very, uh, this, this guideline doesn't seem to uh, have much protection for the people involved. So Batson was towards blacks, Batson versus Kentucky was towards blacks, but then it's been extended to different areas. So not just race anymore. Uh, you can't exclude on the basis of gender. Right? So this is an extension of Batson, how Batson has, uh, its scope has been increased. Right? Uh, you can't exclude homosexuals. And then in one case, strangely enough, Italians. Now, let's think about that last one for a minute. Why on earth would anyone ever be concerned about the exclusion of Italians from a jury? Well, if you're thinking mob cases, if you're thinking mafia, then you can see where this kind of makes sense, that we can't systematically exclude Italians from the jury because it's a mob case and the defendant is necessarily Italian. So uh, it, it was extended to Italians, at least in, in that particular instance. Now, where has Batson not been extended, right? So cognizable groups, right, because that's what we're talking about here, is excluding cognizable groups is disallowed by Batson, and it's expended, extended to all these different cognizable groups. It's not been extended in cases of the obese. So when people try to extend Batson to obese, not so much. Now this might be in civil cases as much as anything, and that is uh, that, that maybe someone who's obese brings a suit against an airline for charging them to have to take two seats, right, and have to pay for both seats. Um, and, and then, you know, you systematically as the defendant tried to exclude obese people from the jury uh, so that they are not sympathetic towards the plaintiff in that regard. Uh, so not the obese, not the bilingual, right? Okay. Uh, not religion, so no protections there, no extensions of Batson, and, and not for little people as well. Okay, so, and you gotta, gotta, gotta wonder what the course is. Now, I want you to kind of do a little thought experiment here. That is, imagine that you have Three trials, three juries. Pick right and go home through the jury selection process. Pick wrong and do not pass go. So let us then, uh, I'll give you three examples. Let's suppose that 
you were arrested for drunk driving. You went out to lunch with some folks, you had an extra drink, maybe more than one you should have ha shouldn't have had. Uh, what do you want your jury to look like? And, and when you're selecting your jury, think about the different dimensions that you can select on, on the basis. Men? Do you want men or women? Do you have a preference? What about ethnicity? And let's break it up. Let's, let's go for uh, ethnicities. Let's go white, black, Hispanic, or Asian, right? But then another important criteria might be age group. So do you want young? Do you want young middle-aged? Do you want older middle-aged? Or do you want elderly? And now notice that you get to pick. You get to fill your jury up with 12 people, right, uh, in this thought experiment. Who do you want on your drunk driving? Do you want white middle-aged men? Do you want to make sure not to have any white middle-aged women? Do you want to exclude mothers? How is it? Uh, so think about that for a little bit. Let's do two more cases. Let's suppose you're caught at a party, uh, you're, you're smoking cannabis at a party and someone you meet at the party who seems really cool asks you if you can get them some and you happen to know someone, right? Uh, you, got, you got a friend, you got a plug, however you want to put it, uh, and, and you fix them up. To no profit to yourself, you just fix them up, but then it turns out to be an undercover police officer and now you've been arrested for selling cannabis, all right? Who do you want on your jury? Do you want a youngest jury you can get? Do you want men versus women? Do you want Hispanics or not? Do you want to omit Hispanics? How do you feel about the Asians, right? Uh, and then let's do the last one. And let's put a different kind of twist on this. Let's suppose that, uh, ima imagine yourself to be 82 years old and your spouse has a terminal illness that's causing them great pain. And uh, they beg you and they beg you, kind of like the Zygimek case, you know, can you please put me out of my misery? Can you please put me to death? Because I can't do it myself. So you put this person to death at their request, at their wish, to relieve them from their pain. But lo and behold, now you're being prosecuted for second degree murder. Uh, what do you do? Who do you want on your jury in this case? You want men? You want women? You want elderly? You want young? Is ethnicity going to matter? So these are kind of the decisions that maybe we're, we're confronted with in, in trying to determine what a favorable jury would look like according to an unfavorable jury. And people believe that the stakes are high because it's an adversarial system. So pick right, go home, pick wrong, and go to jail, maybe for a good long time. Questions? All right, so juror admissions during voir dire. Some jurors in the Marsha Col Colby case, right? So when, when the voir dire, when people are being interviewed, when they're seeing and speaking, right? Uh, in, in the Colby case, allegations of killing a child so disturbing could not honor the presumption of innocence. So now as a juror, I walk in and say, oh my God, this is about killing a child. I'm just like, I'm going to start off believing guilt rather than innocence. And notice that's not appropriate. A uh, close relationship with state investigators gives him instant credibility. So because I know this person who is going to testify on behalf of the state, uh, and I know this person like, you know, we, we grew up together, uh, they never tell a lie. So now notice their credibility is enhanced because of my relationship, not because of the nature of the testimony. Or uh, someone says, I trust law enforcement. He knew to the point where he would believe anything they say because law enforcement, you know, and, and some people are like that. These are people that we probably want to keep out of the jury because they're going to be inflexibly biased. Okay. Now, that's all well and good. We've kind of talked about how we would choose, but how do lawyers choose? And we're, we're going to look at kind of three kind of areas that kind of uh, where lawyers might fall into. Obviously, there's going to be exceptions or, or uh, combinations. But So we can talk about implicit personality theories as, as we're coming up, intuition about group behavior, and uh, we can talk about doing this with the help of consultants. So let's talk about implicit personality theories first. Our intuitions kind of guide us to the traits that co-occur. Right? So, so we believe that what we can observe in people and when we listen to people and how people are dressed, might then, those, those traits that we can monitor, we somehow believe those traits then would indicate how they would rule on a given case. 
given the details of, of the defendant, the nature of the crime, etc. Uh, so we use this to form impressions. Right? The first day you walk into class and you look at that teacher standing up there, walk up, or are you trying to say, think out, uh, think about what this class is going to be like, or who this new teacher is that you've never had before. What are they going to be like? And does the fact that they are in Levi's and a t-shirt change your impression about how they'll behave, right? Uh, maybe in terms of approachability to someone who walks in and is very uh, nicely attired in a, in a three-piece suit. Might that then change your impression? And notice this is something we automatically do, often outside of our awareness. So then we use these impressions to predict future traits. In the context we're describing then, this is we're using it to predict how they might rule uh, on the case, react to certain pieces of evidence, etc. This has many important consequences. Selective attention, processing, and memory, and remember the wheel that we spun around, that is our goals, motivations, and emotions, then affect our attention. Well, we will be more likely to attend to certain features and less likely to attend to other features. It will make a difference in how we remember and how we process evidence, right? Uh, so all, all of these then might occur as a result of implicit personality theories. You might get the idea, yeah, that I'm talking about stereotyping, and that's basically where we're going with this, right? So, and note that when you're selecting your own jury, for those three crimes I listed, did you invoke certain stereotypes about behavior? That was the purpose of the thought experiment. Uh, lawyers' theories, then, there's tons of them, right? A 1985 primer on jury selection said, so this is what lawyers wrote for lawyers on how to select a jury. Women are born skeptics, and they're skeptical in direct proportion to the physical beauty of female witnesses. Ah, so the more attractive the female witness, I guess that evokes uh, jealousy in, in the female jury members and then discredits her testimony to a greater degree. You know, so this is based on, uh, on a stereotype, right? Uh, and it might be a stereotype that was generated by personal experience, but we know that that is still unreliable. The info that they're working with is limited in this case, right? And, and so people tend to use visible, easily determined uh, characteristics are especially important in developing these kind of uh, implicit theories. Gender, age, religion, occupation all come to the forefront as uh, categories that will be used in, in this regard. Let's talk about this. Who is this? Who am I? Number 14. No, not really, but uh, we got a picture of Marsha Clark here. And Marsha Clark was, of course, on the uh, Gol Goldman uh, Brown murder case by O.J. Simpson. And they hired a lot of jury consultants, which is something we'll talk about later. And they advised uh, Marsha Clark to stay away from black women on the jury. And they said, you're not going to play, with black, play well with black women. Uh, they're not going to kind of give you the benefit of the doubt. And uh, she went through two jury consulting firms and then finally hired a third that would more agree with her because Marsha Clark was convinced that black women really love me. And, and she said that black women are going to be more likely to be beaten up by uh, male companions, So, and we're going to bring up O.J.'s history of, of violence towards Nicole Brown Simpson, and, and that will resonate with black women, and they'll want to punish uh, O.J., they'll find him guilty on behalf of um, all those black women uh, historically who've been downtrodden. Well, it didn't work like that, and the jury consultants knew it wasn't going to work like that, but Marsha Clark was convinced. She said, ah, black women really love me, and uh, boy, was that a mistake on her part. It sure played into O.J.'s hands and O.J.'s defense team. Right. I'm not saying whether O.J. was guilty or not. That's not the issue. What I'm saying is Marsha Clark thought she knew better than the people she hired to do the job at the state's expense, fascinatingly enough, and it didn't work out on uh, it didn't work out for her at all. Okay, so let's uh, I'm gonna I want us to revisit Clarence Darrow here, and uh, you can see how a very brilliant attorney though succumbs to these stereotypes. Uh, so I, I try to get a jury with little education but hu much human emotion, and that might be kind of the best <laughs> best idea of the bunch. Uh, everything else here is kind of on, on the level of dribble. 
Uh, the Irish are always best for the defense. I don't want a Scotchman for he has too little human feelings. I don't want a Scandinavian for he has too strong respect for law as law. In general, I don't want a religious person for he believes in sin and punishment. The defense should avoid rich men who as high regard for the law as they make and use it. The smug and ultra-respectable thin, right, I guess those are all the people in California, uh, they're the guardians of society and they believe the law is for them. I, so the utility obviously is uh, questionable in, in this advice, right? And, but notice it's stereotype laden and that's what we keep getting back to. I want to talk about something that's different now. It's not based uh, solely on rejecting people because of their basis, but this is actually looking for someone uh, that might have a powerful influence, and it's called the One Verdict Theory. Now, attorneys who subscribe to this idea, what are they saying? Well, the final jury decision is determined by the opinion of one strong-willed verbal jury juror. So you have one person that you can count on. If you see this person, right, who who is is fits these qualities, a strong-willed, that they talk well, right, then get that person on the jury. If you know they're on your side, they will then shape the jury's decision making. They will move the jury to the idea. This person is the key juror, right? High status and power in the real world, most likely. Uh, Marcus et al. said the, the key jurors intend to be male, extroverts, tall people, and you should watch the show 12 Angry Men if you got the time while we're under pandemic. I would check it out. This is exactly who the key juror was, was uh, Henry Fonda, an architect. Okay, let's shut down uh, part two here and we'll come back for part three.